395 in your hymnal, 395, I have a song that Jesus gave me, it was sent from heaven above, 395, let's all stand together as we sing, in my heart there rings a melody, on that first together, I have a song that Jesus gave me. Good singing this morning, and happy Mother's Day to you. And uh, day, I hope you have a special day, ladies. Uh, we have a gift for you in a little bit. I'll talk to you about that. But I hope you have a wonderful day, and uh, folks will express their love to you and uh, appreciation for all you do, uh, all the days of the year. And uh, it sure is uh, glad. I'm glad uh, we studied it. Uh, we read about it in Sunday school this morning. Um, I think uh, President Wilson signed it into law in 1914. So for the last 101 years, uh, we've had Mother's Day the second Sunday of May. And uh, there's a little tidbit of useless information for you, but uh, there you have it, all right? And uh, glad you're here this morning and uh, looking forward to a good service here together today. Thanks for being in church on Mother's Day. Let's pray together, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer now, and Lord, we pray your blessing on our service together this morning. Thank you, Lord, for mothers, godly influences in our life, Lord, who have prayed for us and guided us and counseled us and loved us and forgiven us. And Lord, I pray a special blessing upon the mothers in attendance here, that they would receive a blessing from the service this morning. And Lord, they would uh, feel very loved by those whom they've given birth to today. And Lord, I pray your blessing on our service, that you would make it just what you would want it to be, yeah. that you would be pleased and you would be exalted. Our desire and our prayer would be that you'd be glorified, that uh, you would be lifted up in our service. Hallelujah. And I pray, God, you'd meet our needs today. Bless the music, bless our fellowship together, and honor the preaching of your word today. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated.
Well, if we're living in the shadow of the cross, and we can uh, have joy unspeakable and full of, full of glory. Let's turn to 283 together. 283, I have found his grace is all complete. He supplieth every need. 283, on that first together. I have found his grace is all Some announcements now. Listen carefully, if you would. Our schedule today, uh, there's no Christian growth class this evening, but we will be here at 6.30 for the evening service tonight. And I uh, hope you'll be back for church on Sunday evening. Uh, Lord willing, tonight I'm going to talk to you about only one life. Only one life. And uh, share some thoughts with you about that. And uh, most of you realize we only have one Opportunity, one life to go through and uh, make it count for Christ, all right? Um, we are in the midst of Operation Saturation. We're getting the flyers out uh, for the Country Fair, which is this coming Saturday uh, from noon to 4. Uh, all of us will be working. We'll be here at 9 a.m. on Saturday, and uh, we'll have a brief time of instruction and prayer here, and then go out and get things ready and set up and prepared. Uh, for the folks the Lord will send our way on Saturday, all right? And uh, But we're a little behind in our flyers, all right? We have 9,000 or so approximately that have gotten out this week, 
and uh, that means we've got to get 11 out this week, okay? So we're, we're a little behind the curve. So we need all hands on deck, okay? Uh, you got to, we need everybody doing it and uh, getting them out. They're on the table down in the conference room. There's a clipboard there. Just sign out what you take and then pass them out and uh, get the word out and uh, let folks know they got a free carnival they can come to on Saturday, okay? Uh, free is a really interesting word. It gets people's attention for sure, all right? And uh, so uh, let's get busy on that and to get those out this week. Um, next week uh, on Saturday for the bus, uh, if anybody has a cooler, not a, not a huge one, just a normal kind of size cooler that would sit on the bus seat or something, we like to uh, make sure they have water on that bus uh, as they drive around next Saturday. It'll be a little warm. And uh, so if you have something like that and you see Brother Linke, Brother Linke's in the choir, put your hand up, Brother Brett, and uh, you see him and uh, he'll fix you up, uh, let you know where you can bring, get that to him uh, for a cooler for the bus, all right? And, uh, and then if you're willing to help uh, on the bus route, uh, they could use a couple workers for Saturday, going to have uh, extra riders and bringing extra kids and writing down names and addresses and marking hands and different things. Uh, if you can help and you'd say, well, I'll help get kids in on that day, then uh, you see Brother Linke as well. Uh, we could use help in the bus area uh, for that Saturday. All right. I think that's what I have right now. Uh, let's take a moment and let's welcome our guests that are with us today on Mother's Day. We're always pleased when folks will visit with us in the service. And if you're visiting this morning and you're not a member here, this is your first time, or you brought a guest with you, would you honor us by standing for a minute? And uh, got, some, got some granddaughters here with you, don't you, Debbie? You're going to introduce them? They're going to introduce themselves. Why don't you introduce them? Talia and Taylor. Good, good. Good to have you girls today. Thanks for coming to church with Grandma on Mother's Day. And over here, Rick. All right, good to see you, Rick. And That's great. Yeah, Rick and Laney. They were both here Friday night, and uh, they had came out yesterday and helped clean the bus and uh, get that ready. And good to see both here this morning. God bless you. Thank you. That's good. And uh, good to have you in attendance this morning looking around anybody else we miss okay that's great um, we're going to give uh, we have a cd we want to give to the mothers not right now fellas we'll do it at the end of the service um, this is a cd called she shall be praised and uh, there's several songs on this it's a uh, it's a song for mothers it's another song called in your good hand uh, an old song called my mother's bible some of you remember that one. And then there's a new song on here called Choose Life. And I think you'll enjoy listening to these songs, and uh, they'll speak to your heart. I think that's a wonderful uh, gift we'd like for you to have. Uh, and we'll give those out at the conclusion of the service today. Okay? All right. Let's give all our guests a warm welcome, shall we? Just let 
let me live my life. Let it be pleasing, Lord, to Thee. And should I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. With His blood, He has saved me. With His power, He has raised me. To God be the glory for the Eighty-five in your hymnal, 285. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms, 285. We're going to sing that first and last together. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace of mind, leaning on the everlasting arms. morning. Let's turn over to 191, if you would. 191. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Let's all stand together one more time as we sing. When upon life's billows on that first. Or when upon life's billows you are tempest on. When you are disturbing
and greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together. Had others with their lands and gold Think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold Count your many blessings money cannot buy Your reward in heaven nor your home on high Count your blessings, name them one by one Count your blessings, see what God has done together so amid the conflict whether great or small as you find your seats let's sing that last so amid the conflict whether great or small do not be discouraged God is over all count your many blessings angels will attend help and comfort give you to your journey's end count your blessings name them one by one Everybody said, you can be seated. Thank you. Good singing this morning. Ushers are coming. They'll be ready to receive our offering today. Now, if you filled out your welcome card, uh, we appreciate you putting that in the plate as it goes by. Keep the pen as our gift to you for coming today. We're glad you're here, and the rest of us will give as God has blessed and prospered us. And uh, look forward to the opportunity to give back to the Lord. Amen. Let's pray, and we'll ask God's blessing on the offering today. Brother Wallace. Let us pray. Father, thank you again. Uh, Lord, we love you. We want to hear from you this morning. Lord, that's our desire when we come in here. I hope that, uh, Lord, when we open up your word, that uh, we earnestly want to hear you talk to each and every one of us to let us know exactly what you would want us to do as a Christian and, Lord, as a personal servant for you. Now, Lord, help us. Bless the rest of the service. Bless the ones who give, the giver. Lord, uh, we just... Uh, pray that uh, when we walk out of here today we'll know that we've heard from you lord touch our hearts touch our spirit in jesus name we pray amen, amen.
Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading, please. 2 Samuel chapter 21. 2 Samuel chapter 21, please. <clears throat> we are going to read verses 1 through 7. Verses 1 through 7, and we read them responsively. We begin together on verse 1, then I read 2, and together again on 3, and alternating till we end together on verse 7 of 2 Samuel chapter 21. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture, all of us standing to read God's Word. Let's begin together on verse 1 of 2 Samuel 21. Ready? Then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver, nor gold of Saul, nor of his house, neither for us shalt thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, What shall ye say? What will I do for you? And they answered the king, The man that consumed us, and that devised against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coasts of Israel. Let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord did choose. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the Scripture. And Father, we pray that you will continue to prepare our hearts, make us ready to receive the truth that you have for us this morning. Lord, I pray that each of us would have ears to hear what you would want to say to your church today. Lord, bless the special now. Help each of us to give our attention and ask you to speak to our heart today. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies with her heart her husband trusts her and her children bring her joy they will rise up and call her blessed they will thank her for understanding many times have done wisely, but she excels them all. They will rise up and call her blessed. They will praise her for all her wisdom. Many daughters have done wisely, but she excels them all. In her heart, is nothing but kindness on her lips are blessing and goodness she is gentle kind and tender all her family sing her praise they will rise up and call her blessed they will thank her for understanding many times have done wisely, but she excels them all. They will rise up and call her blessed. They will praise her for all her wisdom. Many 
daughters have done wisely, but she excels them all. Worldly favor surely is passing, outward beauty quickly will vanish, but the wife with inward beauty is a jewel beyond compare. They will rise up and call her blessed. They will thank her for understanding. Many daughters have done wisely, but she excels them all. She, they will rise up and call her blessed. They will praise her for all her wisdom. Many daughters have done wisely, but she excels them all. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer now. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity we have to open up your word together. And Father, I pray that you would honor the preaching of your word this morning. Lord, I, I want to say the things that need to be said, and I want to leave unsaid things that don't need to be said. And so, Lord, I want your help and your guidance as I bring the truth today. And please help each one to listen and help each one to receive from you what they need to hear today. So, Holy Spirit of God, do what only you can do in these next few moments that we spend together looking into your word. And I'll thank you in advance for what I believe you'll do in our midst this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the columns I used to read in the newspaper, um, some of the younger generation, you may not know what a newspaper is, but um, they used to print stuff on paper and send it to your house, um, and you'd read it. And one of the columns that I remember reading as a young boy uh, it, that, that was always humorous and funny to me was someone named Irma Bombeck. Uh, you may be familiar with Irma Bombeck? Some of you ladies are. She wrote this article. She said, For the first four or five years after I had children, I considered motherhood a temporary condition, not a calling. It was a time of my life set aside for exhaustion and long hours. It would pass. But one afternoon, with three kids in tow, I came out of the supermarket pushing a cart with four wheels that went in opposite directions when my toddler son got away from me. And just outside the door, he ran toward a machine holding, a bubble, holding bubble gum in a glass dome. In a voice that shattered glass, he shouted, Give me, give me. I told him I would give him what for if he didn't stop shouting and get into the car. As I physically tried to pry his body from around the bubble gum machine, he pulled the entire thing over. Glass and balls of bubble gum went all over the parking lot. We have now attracted a sizable crowd. I told him he would never see a cartoon as long as he lived, and if he didn't control his temper, he would be making license plates for the state. He tried to stifle his sobs as he looked around at the staring crowd. He said, then he did something that I would remember for the rest of my life. In his helpless quest for comfort, he turned to the only one he trusted with his emotions, me. He threw his arms around my knees and held on for dear life. I had humiliated him, chastised him, and berated him, but I was still all he had. And that single incident defined my role. I was a major force in this child's life. And she says, sometimes we forget how important stability is to a child. I've always told mine the easiest part of being a mother is giving birth. The hardest part is showing up for it every day. And Mother's Day is traditionally a day when children like to give back to their mothers <clears throat> for some of the things they've done through the years as far as washing all the clothes and getting old gum maybe out of their hair, uh, noses they wipe and bloody knees they made well with a kiss, um, 
driving kids to school when they miss the bus, maybe during sporting events in the rain and the cold, uh, encouraging them to finish something when they didn't think they could finish or didn't think that they could do it. And while the cards may or may not reflect their sentiments, I think what they might be trying to say is, Mom, thanks for showing up. Just thanks for showing up. And so this is a time to honor our mothers. And I'm going to speak to you this morning on a subject called, What a Mother. What a Mother. And that's going to be an unusual mother that you look at today. And I probably would say I, I had never heard a message on this woman, and I just came across her this week and, and jumped out to me. Back in your Bible in 2 Samuel chapter 21, you're going to get introduced to her here in the next few verses. We read the first seven verses of 2 Samuel 21, and as we read them, you might have think, you might have thought to yourself, what in the world does this have to do with Mother's Day? Well, let's look at verse 8. But the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, whom she bare unto Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, not the same Mephibosheth who was Jonathan's son, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholathite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord. And they fell all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of barley harvest. And Rizpah, the daughter of Ahiah, took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock, from the beginning of the harvest until water dropped upon them out of heaven, and suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. And it was told David what Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, the concubine of Saul, had done. And David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son from the men of Jabesh-Gilead, which had stolen them from the streets of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hanged them when the Philistines had slain Saul in Gilboa. And he brought them up thence, the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son, and they gathered the bones of them that were hanged. And the bones of Saul and Jonathan his son buried they in the country of Benjamin in Zelah, in the sepulcher of Kish his father. And they performed all that the king commanded, and after that God was entreated for the land. Here's what's going on in chapter 21. There's a famine. The famine has gone on for three years. And finally, somebody got the idea, maybe we better ask God why we have such a famine. What is going on? And so they pray to the Lord, and the Lord says, it's because of the Gibeonites. And what happened was, if you remember, if you remember history, Joshua came across a group of people when they were entering into the Promised Land, and uh, they had disguised themselves, remember? They had put on old clothes, and they got moldy bread, and, and they tried to tell Joshua, oh, we're from a far country. Uh, we're just traveling. And so they made a league. Joshua made a promise to them, a treaty, if you will, that says, okay, we won't harm you. We will not destroy you. Because God had told them, as you go into the promised land, you're to utterly drive out all the inhabitants. You're not to leave anybody there. And, and so they spared the Gibeonites because they did not know they were from the land. Now, it was discovered that they were phonies. It was discovered that they, they lied about who they were. But yet, for his oath's sake, for his promise that he made before God, that he wouldn't harm the Gibeonites, Joshua said, you can stay. Now, Saul, 400 years later, Saul is king. And knowing, by the way, Saul knew that God had taken the kingdom from him and he would no longer be able to be king. But he did a lot of things that were not led by God. And, and he, just out of his own zeal and his own pride and his own self-will. And one of the things he did was he attacked the Gibeonites and he killed many of them. And because he had done that, God was sending a punishment to Israel. And now David says, what can I do? And he calls the Gibeonites in, the few that were there, and he said, what can I do to make up for this? And the fellow said, let's have seven of his sons come and we'll kill them and hang them up to the Lord. And so that's what they did. And when they bring these sons, two of them 
were sons of a woman named Rizpah. Now, many of you may not even heard of Rizpah till this morning. But here she is, and two of her boys are going to get hung up. And we're going to read, and we're going to find out something about this devoted mother of Rizpah and what she did. And I hope it will encourage, and I know it will challenge, those of you who are mothers here in the room today. And I want to say, give you several points today. Number one is, godly mothers like Rizpah love their children. We're going to explain exactly what that means. Notice what happened. What, look what Rizpah did. They hang the sons, they hang these, these fellows on a hill. They hang them out in, in, in the days of the harvest. And look what Rizpah did in verse 10. She took sackcloth, spread it for upon the rock, from the beginning of the harvest until water dropped upon them out of heaven, and suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. So here are these, these corpses hanging out there, and no one's there because nobody cares. Oh, but there is somebody there. Who is it? It's, rich. it's mom. Mom is still there, and mom's going to stay there, and mom's going to protect the bodies of her son. Mom is going to have, show some unconditional love. Her sons are being executed as criminals, but she's still there. I read this week that there was a fella in Dallas, Texas, who was watching a woman weep at a grave, and he walked up to the grave to see if he could help bring some comfort to the woman. And it was the mother of Lee Harvey Oswald weeping at his grave, saying, does nobody care that my son's dead? Does nobody care that my son's dead? Mother's there. Unconditional love. A mother's love is to be unconditional. And mothers do love unconditionally. Mothers love no matter what. It means there's no strings attached. It doesn't mean they always approve of what their children do, but it means they love them nonetheless. That's what unconditional love is, much like God's love for you and me. God's love for you and me is unconditional. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. My friend, God loved everyone, and God loves... Listen, God loves the person who is not in church this morning. God loves the person who uh, is, is may, might even shake their fist at God today. Even the one who doesn't believe God even exists. God loves that person just as much as He loves you or He loves me. His love is unconditional. A mother's love is unconditional. Now, let me make that practical to you, will you? Keep your finger there in, uh, or a piece of paper there in 2 Samuel. I want you to turn to the New Testament and look at 1 Corinthians 13 with me, will you please? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, 1 Corinthians 13 talks about charity. Charity is the highest level of love that you can have. It, is, it would be the perfection of unconditional love. Charity carries with it not the only idea of Love where you willingly and sacrificially give yourself for the benefit of somebody else with no thought of return. That's what love is. When you willingly or sacrificially will give yourself for the benefit of somebody else with no expectations of return. All right? But now charity says, I'll not only do that, but I'm going to want the best for you as well. Now listen, I can do something for the benefit of somebody else and not expect any in return, but not necessarily like you. That's why the Bible says we can love our enemies. What does that mean? I can meet their needs. I can willingly, sacrificially give to meet their need, but it doesn't necessarily mean I like them. Okay? But I can love them. Because I can sacrifice. Now, charity is where I don't just do what is best for you. I want what is best for you. And doesn't that picture what a mother's love is for her children? They don't just love them. They want what is best. Here's practically what the Bible says about charity or having that unconditional love that a mother has for her children. And sometimes we read, you know, sometimes we read things in the Bible and we, we, we don't ever apply them to the four walls of our home. 
We're, we're good with strangers. We're good with people at the church. And then we go home and all these things we read about in the Bible of how to treat other people, we don't put them into practice where we live. And so this, this takes us right into the home. Notice what he says here. Charity, verse number 4. Charity suffers long and is kind. The first thing I see here about charity and the, the unconditional love is it's long-suffering. It's long-suffering. It's, it's very patient with the shortcomings of others. Parents, you have to be long-suffering with the shortcomings of your children. Patience. Our children may be intelligent, but they still don't have an adult grasp of certain concepts or what things are all about. Children are not little adults. Okay? And you have to understand that. They're forgetful. You have to remind them of things. No, ladies, I'm not talking about your husband, though that may fit too. But, but you have to remind them of work that needs to get done, homework that may be due, uh, necessity of picking up their clothes or picking up their toys. You know, to a child, when they're having fun, um, hours can seem like minutes. But when they have to stand in line and behave or sit in church and behave, minutes can seem like hours. Remember that? And you have to have patience. You have to be long-suffering with your children. Exercise that love. It demonstrates your love. Let me ask you a question. Is God long-suffering with you? Is God patient with you? Uh, we should exhibit that and we should show that to our children. So love is long-suffering. But then it says, love is just not long-suffering, it's kind. Love doesn't just suffer long, love is kind. It's, it's, it's being patient and, 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 and with the behavior sometimes, but then still being kind. Did you know children need to hear kind words? Encouraging words? How often do you tell your children you love them? How often do you say those words? Well, I'm just not the loving type. Well, then get that way. Okay? Then, then well, I'm not comfortable doing that. Then be uncomfortable and do it. But you need to do it. It's sad. To, it's sad. Listen, don't, don't be one of those folks who, at your service, and you're laid out in front of the pulpit, and your children come by and say, I never heard Mama say she loved me. I never heard Dad say he loved me. Hmm? Say it. And be kind and speak words of affirmation to them. Praising them. Don't just show irritation with their actions. And irritation with what they do. And never show praise with what they do right. Oftentimes we're good at pointing out the wrong. You know, most children grow up with the idea, I can never please Mom and Dad. They're just never satisfied. You don't, want to be, you don't want to get in that position. Years ago, they did a, a test on some chimpanzees. They were given, some were given food and water, but denied the touch of another chimpanzee or another human being. Others were made to have physical contact and touch with others. The ones who did not have any physical contact and any physical interaction with others ended up dying. You have to have that. You need to give your children that kindness. Give the children that support. You know, children live up to their expectations. If you expect them to be bad, that's exactly what they'll be. You expect them to do good and you expect them to do well and you let them know that, that they will do that way. You know what? They'll seek to live up to that. They'll live to your expectations. Be kind. Then the Bible says, look at charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Charity is not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly. In other words, love is not rude. It doesn't act unbecoming. In other words, mom, you have to be courteous. You have to be loving to your children. You expect your children to say please and thank you. Let me ask you a question, mom and dad. Do you? 
Are you requiring things of them that you don't do yourself? If you're gonna, if you expect them to say I'm sorry when I'm wrong and forgive me, do they hear you say I'm sorry and I please forgive me when you're wrong? You have to treat them with the same consideration. If if I tell my child don't interrupt me when I'm talking, do I interrupt them when they're talking? We have to be careful. Sometimes we don't let children use certain terms and then they hear us use them. Be careful. You want them to be polite and courteous and kind to others, you have to be that way yourself. That's showing them love. Something to think about, isn't it? Then it's interesting. The Bible says this. It's, it's kind. Love suffers long and is kind. Charity him not. It says, Do not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. And boy, we could spend time on each one of these. But look at, look at this last one. Thinketh no evil. You know what that means? It means you don't keep any record of wrongs. When you forgive your child, and by the way, when they do wrong, it, you, their, their whole idea of God's forgiveness is going to be based on how you handle their wrongs. And so when you say, listen, you've done wrong, you violated the commandment, and whatever the discipline is that you need to meet out for them, and then you ask, say, now, you've sinned against, who have you sinned against? You've sinned against mom and dad. Who else have you sinned against? You've sinned against God, that's right. So what do we do? We need to ask forgiveness. You need to ask forgiveness of mom and dad. You need to ask forgiveness of God. And then when that forgiveness is asked for and granted and you have prayer together, guess what? That's done. That's over. Don't bring that up again. Don't, don't, don't wait three days to say, hey, 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 hey. Now you did that the other day too. You're not going to do that again. Wait a minute, I thought you forgave that. I thought that was taken care of. Don't still hold that against them. Don't keep record of the wrongs. All right, that's enough. That's the straw that broke the camel's back. Well, what are you collecting straws for? You know what I mean? You're keeping record of the wrongs. Don't keep record. Love thinketh no evil. Did you know the only time in the Bible, God is ever pictured in a hurry is when He's in a hurry to forgive us of our sins. I think the only time it pictured the father running was when the prodigal was coming home and the father ran to meet him. It's the only time I think God was in a hurry. But He's eager to forgive and He wants to. Then it says... The charity rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. A mother will maintain her honesty and her integrity no matter what the circumstances. Hey, uh, children ought to be able to trust a mother's word and, and trust her promises. No white lies, no half-truths, no situational lying. Don't, don't excuse your child's actions by blaming a school teacher or blaming some other circumstance, somebody else when your child makes a mistake. You'll encourage children to pay their debts and keep their responsibilities. Don't tell stories, quote, unquote, just to satisfy their curiosity about something. Okay? Don't tell them little white lies. Okay? Just to keep them quiet. You have to love them. You can go down 1 Corinthians 13 and say, am I loving my child unconditionally? But secondly, Rizpah didn't just love her child, she protected her children. Sit tight now. She protected her children. She went out there, and, and by the way, you know how long she stood by that mountain where they were hung up, and she stayed there, and she kept the buzzards away and the, the, the vultures that would come in the daytime and any wild beasts that might want to come at night? Six months six 
months she stayed there to guard the bodies of her son, trying to protect her children. How diligent are you, mom and dad, to protect your children? So what am I protecting from? Don't, don't you realize that somebody's after your children? Your children are at risk. Whether it's music, the media, motion pictures, all sorts of things. There's, there's a plan, and by the way, weaved by Satan to get our children, to get at the next generation. And our battle, the Bible says, is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness of this world. It's against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's a real battle for the next generation. It's a real battle for our children. And the devil, the Bible says, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. And my friend, I'll guarantee you, the ones he loves to devour the most are the little ones, the young ones. He's coming after your children. You can bury your head in the sand if you want, but teen suicide is still the number one killer of teenagers. Over one million young girls get pregnant each year. Teen sexuality has increased over 400% in recent years. And by the way, that's not just from unchristian kids, that's Christian kids. Christian kids that are less and less Christian all the time. You don't know how to do parents sometime? Sit down with your children and just ask them, what does Jesus mean to you? Have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with them. And ask them, what does Jesus really mean to you? And be prepared for the answers you get. Don't just, just find out what's really in their heart. Satan, if he can get them when they're young, he'll have them the rest of their life. And he'll seek whatever means he can to turn your children's heart away from you and away from God. you got to wake up. You have to protect your children. You have to understand there is an enemy. Listen, if, if, if you were sitting in your home and you... Uh, saw the bulletin come across the television that a lion had escaped from the zoo and it's in your neighborhood and you looked out your window and there he is in your front yard. Would you say, oh, I guess I'll call somebody. He's in my front yard. Before you might, you might call someone and you might get on the phone and get 911, but you know what you're going to do? You're going to go check on your children. You're going to check the doors that they're secure, the windows that they're closed. You're going to do all you can to make sure that lion does not have an entrance to get into your children. Well, my friend, there is a lion outside your house. In fact, sometimes there's a lion inside your house. And you better be aware and be protective of your children. Be a rispa and protect your children. Let me give you a couple practical things how you can protect them. Number one, be aware of what's really happening in our society. Would you look at things, mom and dad? Would you look at things? You ought to know, hey, you ought to know what your children's doing on a computer. You ought to know what your children's doing on their cell phone. You ought to, you ought to know what your children's doing with the television and with their iPod and the music that they're listening to. Be be. be be aware that there's an agenda to destroy your children. Man, don't bury your head in the sand. It's like, it's like the survey they took about, uh, they, they, they take a survey and, and it's, it's incredible. Eighty-some percent of parents understand that, that, the, that, listen, that the state schools, by the way, it's not public school anymore. If you think it's public school, try to go down and influence them a little bit about the curriculum. Try to, try to put your input in. They're not interested in what you want to say. They have an agenda. And you better understand it. And, 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 they're, they're, and, and, you, and, and listen, over 80% of people said, yes, 
the school system's wrong and the school system has an agenda. And then they say, what about your school system? And it goes the other way around. Only 20% said, well, no, my school system's okay. Oh, yeah, the place is rotten. No, no, but my guy's good. Hey, and that's how we are with Congress. Congress gets a 6% approval rating, and yet they keep getting reelected. You say, how can that happen? Because everybody thinks, oh, no, they're corrupt, they're wicked. Oh, no, my guy's okay. No, my guy's a good guy. And so we vote him back in. And listen, don't bury your head in the sand and say, man, things are bad or things are wicked. Oh, no, but my kid's school's okay. Oh, no, but my, my kids are all right. They're not involved in anything like that. No, you bury, your head in the, you bury your head in the sand if you want, but that doesn't change the reality. Mom and Dad, you have to guard your children. You have to be discerning about what's going on in the agenda that's happening. Hey, one of the best things you can do to guard your children, protect your children, is have a good marriage. Have a good marriage. Where, where mom and dad are in the home. And while I'm there, I said mom and dad in the home. Mom and mom don't make a home. And dad and dad don't make a home. And if you're, you're a... And, and by the way, you may be a mom. You, you may be a mom like Ruth ended up being. She was a mom by herself. You may have to be mom and dad at home, and that's a tough road to go. That's not an easy job to fill. But it doesn't take a village to raise a child. It takes a mom and dad to raise a child. You need every available soldier on the battlefield, and mom and dad need to be aware. They need to guard your children. You do that, listen, by by loving one another and showing your children what a good marriage is all about. Yeah, I can't stress enough to you parents, listen, your child is going to carry into their marriage what they learn from yours. And the problems they have may, may stem from the, from the things they learned from you that weren't right. How hard are you working to protect your children? Are you modeling Christ to them? Are you giving Christ to your children? Are you concerned about what their peers or the schools are pumping into their heads? Do you talk to them about their belief in God? Do you talk to them about their belief in the Bible? Do you believe that, hey, do you believe that Christ is the Savior? Do you believe He's the only Savior? Do you believe that He's the Good Shepherd? And the shepherd looks out for his sheep? Oh, well, then how vital is it that we make sure our children know Jesus Christ as their Savior? Man, you're not always going to see them. You're not always going to be with them. It's impossible. But the Lord Jesus will always be there. He can always protect them. He can always take care of them. You remember Timothy's legacy from his grandmother to his mother down to him. And by the way, that's in spite of the fact Timothy's dad was not a believer. Timothy's dad didn't share his mom's faith or his grandma's faith. But grandma and mom did. And they taught Timothy too. There's two books in the Bible called First and Second Timothy. One writer said this, We mothers must realize the importance of our examples in the development of our children's character. We must realize that children can see through the masks we put on. Our inner attitudes and thoughts will be revealed to our children by our day-to-day -day words and actions. If a mother says prayer is important, but her children never see or hear her pray, they'll follow her example rather than her words. If a mother says the Bible is an important guide to living, but she never reads the Bible to them or to herself, her children will follow her example and not her words. If a mother says Sunday school and church are necessary, but seldom goes herself, her children will follow her example rather than her words. If a mother says it's important to give to the work of the Lord, but her children see a checkbook that tells a different story, They'll follow her example and not her words. If a mother says God's way is the only right way, but hardly ever gives God a thought as she goes about her daily activities, her children will follow her example and not her words. 
God's way of life needs to be taught verbally, but my friend, your walk has to back up the talk. Or they'll follow what you are, not what you say. Are you protecting your children? Godly mothers like Rizpah love their children. They protect their children. They sacrifice for their children. I mentioned she stayed out there six months for them. That's a sacrifice, my friend. Do you think she enjoyed watching her son's bodies decay and rot right before her eyes? You think the odors and the smell on that hill were very pleasant? You think her arms ever grew tired of trying to fight off the birds during the day or the wild animals at night? Did you ever, you ever think she dreamt of the day when this whole ordeal could be over? And she wouldn't have to be out there every single day? She sacrificed for her children. And a godly mother sacrifices for her children. Listen, listen carefully, mothers, modern-day mothers particularly. You weren't drafted into the position. You volunteered. And God says that next to your relationship with Him, your family is the most important relationship you have. Before your job, before your finances, and anything else you want to do. And, and maybe you'd have less problems with your children in time out if you would spend more time with. You wouldn't have so much time out. I don't understand. Listen, you take the M off mother and what do you have? Others. That's what a mother does. She sacrifices for the rest of the family. It doesn't, you, you, can you imagine? Look at Rispa. Can you imagine her saying, man, I just, I just wish I could get some time to myself. I never have any time for me. Where's my time? Man, I've got to get a break from these kids. I've had enough. I, I'm climbing the walls. Somebody's got to help me. That doesn't sound like a mother who's sacrificing for her children. You volunteered for that position. You wanted those children. And God gave you those children. Sacrifice. Many times, parents as children grow older get a counterfeit peace in the home. Counterfeit harmony, you could call it. A peace treaty. No real issues are resolved, but you're unwilling to stir anything up. You, you put it under the heading of, well, I have to pick my battles. Meaning, you're letting some things go that you know are wrong and you know you shouldn't let go, but you're tired of fighting. There are things, mom and dad, that are not going to be popular with your children. But if they're right, then they need to be done. And as long as they live under your roof, they need to be done. What you need to do is what's best in God's eyes and what's best for your children. And whether they kick and scream or fuss or whatever they do, so be it. I'm the parent. You're the child. This is how it is. You see, it's called, listen, it's called children obey your parents. In some homes, that's impossible to carry out because mom and dad won't give the children anything to obey. Now, what would you like to do today, sweetheart? Do you want to eat this? Oh, you don't want that? Well, let's see, what else can we make you? Huh? Listen, you put the plate down, say, here's dinner. I'm not hungry. Well... Long time till breakfast. This is what we're having. And they, they sit there till they're hungry enough to eat it, or they go to bed without supper. How many ever went to bed without supper? Huh? Oh, and you live to tell about it. Oh, my poor boy, he's going to be so hungry. 
No, he'll learn we're going to eat what I serve you. Parents, be parents. Be the leader. Run the show, not them. Kids are still kids, and they're not quite equipped yet to make the right choices. So God gave them parents to help them and to guide them and to point them in the right direction and to tell them what's right. And don't get weary in the battle. Don't let that happen to you. Oh, if I can just hang on till they get out of the house. Don't do that. Let me close by telling you that godly mothers like Rizpah got rewarded. Did you remember what happened? David, look at, look at the Bible in 2 Samuel 21. Notice verse 11. It was told David what Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. Oh, somebody noticed. They told King David what she was doing. And in response, he went and got those bodies of those men, and he went and got Saul and Jonathan, and brought them back and gave them a proper burial that they deserved. And I'm sure earn the respect of King David. When you do the right things, Mom, God notices. God sees what you're doing. And you will be re rewarded for it. It won't be in vain. Can you picture something with me? Can you picture your, your, your standing on the streets of gold? The mansions are lining the street. Many, many people. You see a brightness down the road and you figure it must be the throne of God. I'm going to head that direction. And as you start to walk, you hear a voice call out from behind you. Mom! Mom! Wait up! And you turn around and see your children there. And maybe before you can say anything, they say, Mom, don't worry. We got the kids here too. Huh? Oh, then it's worth it. Then it's worth it when everybody's there together. William McKinley had a special relationship with his mother. He said this, I cannot subscribe to the idea that luck had very much to do with making me president of the United States. He said, I've never been in doubt since I was old enough to think intelligently that I would someday be president. Now, his mother had other intentions for her son. He was born in Ohio in 1843, child number seven out of nine children, born to William and Nancy McKinley. She was superintendent of the Sunday school, and often would say to her friends that her son would one day be a Methodist preacher. Her comment following McKinley being elected to be the 25th president of the United States, she said, well, that's okay too. President McKinley, his mother, had a close relationship, and during the winter of 1897, she became seriously ill. McKinley installed a special telegraph, a telegraph wire connecting the White House to his mother's home in Canton, Ohio. And he kept a special train ready to leave at the White House whenever they would call for him to come. One night, the elderly woman called for her son, so the nurses wired, Mr. President, we'd think you better come. He sent the answer back saying, tell mother, I'll be there. And he got on the train, and he arrived in time for his mother to die in his arms. When the story hit the newspaper, a man named Charles Fillmore, a hymn writer, was deeply touched with the story, and he felt those words expressed a perfect sentiment for wayward children who needed to meet their mothers in heaven one day. And he penned the words and the music to tell mother, I'll be there. 
Charles Alexander, an evangelist, once claimed that that song had converted more men than any other song. It was often sung for the invitation hymn during the 20th century. In one particular meeting, Charles Alexander said he saw 160 men come to Christ listening to tell mother I'll be there. When I was but a little child, how well I recollect how I would grieve my mother with my folly and neglect. And now that she's gone to heaven, I miss her tender care. Oh, Savior, tell my mother I'll be there. Tell mother I'll be there in answer to her prayer. This message, blessed Savior, to her bear. Tell mother I'll be there, heaven's joys with her to share. Yes, tell my darling mother I'll be there. Though I was often wayward, she was always kind and good. So patient, gentle, loving when I acted rough and rude. My childhood griefs and trials she would gladly with me share. Oh, Savior, tell my mother I'll be there. When I became a prodigal and left the old roof tree, she almost broke her loving heart in mourning after me. And day and night she prayed to God to keep me in His care. O oh, Savior, tell my mother, I'll be there. One day a message came to me, bade me quickly come, if I would see my mother ere the Savior took her home. I promised her before she died for heaven to prepare. O oh, Savior, tell my mother, I'll be there. Can you tell your mother you'll be there? Will you? Do you have the assurance that if you died, you'd go to heaven? Do you know Christ is your Savior? There's no greater joy that could come to a mother's heart than to know that her children will be there. And their children, her grandchildren, are all in. Mothers, love your children. Protect your children. Sacrifice for your children. You will be rewarded. And if you're here today and you're one of those children and you've never received Christ as your Savior, receive Him as your Savior today. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the attention of everyone today. Lord, uh, such a burden on my heart this morning. For us to have godly mothers again. Mothers who realize the, the greatest ministry they have is ministering to their children. Serving their family. Rearing godly men and women for Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, you've challenged the mothers this morning. Those who... need to be comforted and encouraged to have received encouragement as well. And I pray for those in the room who are not certain of their eternity, but with whom you're dealing with their heart today. And today would be the day that they would say, you can tell my mother I'll be there. I'll put my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Speak to hearts this morning, Lord. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. We'll have our invitation. But while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, no one looking. I wonder how many folks here this morning would say, Pastor, I'll be able to say, I'll be there. I know that I've trusted Christ as my Savior. I know I have eternal life. I know if anything happened to me this morning, that I would go to heaven. And Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony. I know that I'm saved. Would you put your hand up for a minute that I may see it? I know that I'm saved. God bless you. You may put them down. I wonder who's here today would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure. I want to, if there's a heaven, I want to be there. I want to be in that place. But I don't have any assurance that that's where I'll go. Could, would you let me pray for you? Not embarrass you, but I'll pray for you. Would you slip your hand up right now and just say, Pastor, pray for me this morning? I'm not sure about my eternity. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. You couldn't raise your hand the first time, but you'll raise it this time. Would you just slip it up and put it back down and say, Pastor, pray for me? Is there something like that today? 
I wonder how many mothers here today would say, Pastor, the Spirit of God stopped at my chair today, spoke to my heart about the importance of being a mother, loving my children, protecting my children, sacrificing for my children, knowing that I'll be rewarded. Pastor, God spoke to my heart today. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up, Mom? Yes. Yes. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart. I want you to respond to him this morning. If you're not sure if you died, you go to heaven. There, there'll be some to come and just pray today. Moms and dads and husbands and wives, just come and to pray together to say, God, help us in our home. Why don't you slip in your seat? I'll, I'll be down here at the front. and Just come and take my hand and say, you know, I'd like to know that I'm going to heaven when I die. And we have people who have been trained. They'll take a Bible and they'll show you how you can be certain of going to heaven. But whatever it is that God's dealt with your heart about, respond to him today. Heavenly Father, bless this invitation now. Thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning. And I pray your will be done in these next few moments of invitation. I pray that each one would do what you're telling them to do in their heart, that no one would resist you today. May your will be done now in these next few minutes, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist is going to play. As she plays, Bob will sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him now this morning, will you please? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is That's calling, right. calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling a sinner. Should we tarry when Jesus is bleeding, bleeding for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Come home. Come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Go ahead and be seated for a minute, if you would, and... We want the ushers to come and get your CD to all the, all the ladies who are here today. We want you to have this CD, okay? So whether you're a mother or not, if you're just a lady here, we want you to have this. Come on, fellas, and you can pass those out. Just uh, put your hand up till you get one so we don't miss anybody, and uh, we'll make sure you have it. You know, Rizpa. Will you ever forget Rizpa now? You'll remember Rizpa, won't you? And uh, what a mother. I, you know, I was thinking I always love this story when talking about encouraging your kids. You know, I like the, the parents always encouraged the little boy, you know, and was always saying good things to him. And he, he was the guy who took the ball and the bat. You know, you just throw the ball up and then you'd hit it. And he, he threw that ball up and he got the bat and he swung and he missed. He picked it up and he threw it a little higher this time and he got ready and he swung and he missed. He got a look of determination and picked that ball up the third time and he threw it up and he swung real hard again and he missed the third time picked the ball up and said, man, what a pitcher. <laughs> All depends on how you look at it, amen? And uh, not, not strike out, but listen, encourage your kids. Amen. Man, they need encouragement. And uh, they'll, they'll, I can't stress enough, they'll live up to your expectations. And 
uh, we're, we don't, listen, we said a few weeks ago that meeting at the prison, you know, listen, we've got a prison problem. We've got, we've got a problem with authority in America because we got a problem in our homes in America. Mom and dad need to be mom and dad again. And, 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 you know, you teach your children. Listen, if you don't teach them to respect you, they're not going to respect the teacher. They're not going to respect the police officer. They're not going to respect their employer. They're not going to respect, have respect for anyone. And they won't respect God. They'll never have a relationship with him. That's a great responsibility, Mom and Dad, and fulfill that responsibility. It's, uh, my wife has been substitute teaching, as most of you know, in sixth graders and you would not believe you just would not believe the disrespect and the, the lack of obedience it's just astounding uh, this is Ruthie Ann by the way she's our bus driver today and uh, Ruth Ann and, uh, and she drives bus and I'm sure she sees it even in the children on the bus um, I tell you it's just we, we've got to get our homes back we got to get back to this and that's where it starts and so we got to get our homes godly moms and dads get back to where we need to be. Amen? All right, let's stand together. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. We'll look forward to seeing you back tonight, 6.30 for the evening service. Hope you have a great afternoon. Uh, hope your children, your husband, someone will treat you well today and uh, honor you on Mother's Day. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for a wonderful morning this morning. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us and for speaking to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for each one that's made their way here. Lord, I pray that you will give each of them a good afternoon. May the mothers in attendance feel the love and appreciation of those who call them mom or wife or even sister or cousin. I pray, Lord, that they would have a special day today and know that each of them, each of us, is special to you. We love you. Give us a good afternoon. Bring us back for the service tonight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joined us with Jesus as we travel this side. I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.